ever since the dawn of cinema, there have been dinosaurs on our screens. But if you compare this to this, it's clear a lot has changed since the medium's primitive roots. Dinosaur movies have definitely come a long way in the past 100 years. So let's talk about it. In this video, we'll be looking at how the way dinosaurs have been portrayed in movies has reflected the changing culture, public opinion, and sensibilities of the past century. But before we get started, just a few things to note. Naturally, this is only a guide, and not meant to be a comprehensive look at every single dinosaur movie ever made. There'll be some that bug the trends I'm gonna talk about, and I might not get round to mentioning your favourite. So if I've missed it out, just let me know what it is in the comments below. The other thing is, for the sake of this video, I'm counting Godzilla as a dinosaur. Look, I know he's a jumped up iguana, but he fits the role of a prehistoric beast in the context of what I'm gonna talk about. Honestly, just count yourself lucky I'm not gonna bring up Godzuki too. Anyway, let's start at the beginning. The earliest movie I could find that featured dinosaurs was Brute Force, released all the way back in 1914. This 30 minute long silent film chronicles the life and times of a group of cavemen as they fend off warring tribes and of course, big lizards. And by today's standards, it looks more than a little rough around the edges. I mean, two of the dinosaurs are quite clearly a snake and crocodile with extra dangly bits glued on them. But given it came out before the trenches of World War One had even been dug, it doesn't look half bad, particularly at the end when we see a looming T-Rex scaled against the cave folk. And this leads me on to why I think dinosaurs appeared on screen so early in the history of cinema. So much of this period was dedicated to showing the fantastical things that up until that point could only be dreamt of. Like a decade prior you had George Melier showing us the surface of the moon and now we had the most awe inspiring monsters walking in front of our very eyes. One thing I have neglected to mention until now is that Brute Force was directed by D.W. Griffith, as he's the man behind arguably the most racist film of all time, The Birth of a Nation. But if we separate the art from the artist, Brute Force is still a landmark piece and starts us off on our cinematic timeline. But dinosaurs weren't just used to show what was possible in front of a camera. They were also used to demonstrate the scope and possibility of the fledgling field of animation. Staying in 1914, we saw the release of Windsor McKay's Gertie the Dinosaur. An animated short that sees the titular Gertie perform tricks like a trained elephant, it's often touted as the very first animated film. Now, this has been refuted by some sources in recent times, but regardless, it's still really, really early in the history of moving pictures. Now, another great thing about films from this time is that a lot of them are available for free on YouTube, so I definitely recommend scoping them out if you have the time. In this particular 10 minute flick, Gertie moves and acts like a real animal. She waddles from side to side as she walks, her chest rises and falls as she breathes, and her muscles move in a naturalistic way. It all imbues her with a personality, showing how mere pencil lines can forge an emotional bond with the audience. Much like Brute Force, Gertie highlighted how animation could bring the impossible to life. And for the most part, this is how dinosaurs were used in the early days of cinema, an example of its limitless potential. And this continued to be the trend for the next decade. Seemingly every innovation was brought about by wanting to show cooler, more realistic dinosaurs. 1925's The Lost World was the first full-length film to feature model animation as its primary special effect, or stop-motion animation in general for that matter. And to tell you what, they still hold up pretty well to this day. Well, astounding, fantastic adventure awaits you in a land of terrifying thrills, where maddened mastodons wage warfare to the death as the earth shakes on its axis, and mere human beings cringe before the awful onslaught of nature running wild. Fast forward to post-World War II, and we enter what I consider the next stage of dinosaur films, which I'm gonna label The Other. This includes films like Unknown Island, Two Lost Worlds, and Lost Continent. If you haven't seen any of these, they're pretty much exactly what you'd expect them to be. A swashbuckling, all-American hero saving the day in a land of savagery. Ooh. 
These themes were present in the earlier King Kong, but they were everywhere post-World War II. I think this trend reflects not only the need for post-war escapism, but also the lust for adventure in an ever-shrinking world. With many returning home after being stationed around the globe, as well as the winding down of colonialism, the time of pith-helmeted explorers had really been and gone. The fallacy that there were savage lands in need of civilizing was disappearing rapidly, so people turned to cinema to scratch that itch. Dinosaurs hidden away on remote islands served as the ultimate portrayal of the quote-unquote other, that brutality that only the bravest of men could conquer unscathed. At a time when the geopolitical stage was becoming increasingly complicated and muddy, the idea of the other gave a clear delineation between us and them. But it wouldn't be long before dinos wouldn't be used so much as an escape to a bygone age, but instead as a reflection of modern fears. Enter Godzilla. I'll say it again, I know Godzilla isn't a dinosaur, but he looks like one, and he fits the mold here. Debuting in 1954, producer Tomoyuki Tanaka used Godzilla as an allegory for the nuclear devastation that crippled Japan less than a decade earlier. He said, The theme of the film from the beginning was the terror of the bomb. Mankind has created the bomb, and now nature was going to take revenge on mankind. By picking a creature that mankind would have never come up against before, it mirrored the unknown threat of nuclear warfare. As director Ashiro Honda put it, If Godzilla had been some other animal, he would have been killed by just one cannonball. But if he were equal to an atomic bomb, we wouldn't know what to do. So I took the characteristics of an atomic bomb and applied them to Godzilla. It's a much more sobering tale than what we've covered so far. Whereas before, dinosaurs were shown as things to be conquered or even subjugated in the case of Gertie, now this pseudo-dino is wreaking havoc unabated. Some of these themes will be expanded upon later, but for now, it's really interesting to see how two very different perspectives of the same historical events could result in such different portrayals of hulking lizards. And while Godzilla would reign supreme for the next two decades in several spin-offs and sequels which kinda diluted the whole anti-war message into B-movie schlock, by the mid-80s we got a decidedly different take on the prehistoric genre. This was found in Don Bluth's 1988 animated classic The Land Before Time, which follows five young dinosaurs as they escape their scorched homeland in search of the sanctuary of the Great Valley. Firstly, don't let its label as a kid's film put you off from checking it out. Don Bluth was famous for not taking it easy on the heavy themes. It's one of the best meditations on child bereavement ever, and even the most stoic of viewers will find it hard not to get a little choked up. To my knowledge, this is the most explicit example of the anthropomorphization of dinosaurs yet. Jesus, you have no idea how many takes it took to do that line properly. Instead of just monsters, or at best, pets, now they're the main characters taking center stage. We're meant to sympathize with their plight, as we would with any human character, and I think this also reflects the times. The Land Before Time came out a few short years after Peter was founded, and the idea that animal life was something to cultivate rather than dominate was rapidly shifting from the fringes into popular opinion. It made sense that this would also be the time that dinosaurs, which for so long were shown as the grotesque extreme of the animal kingdom, would finally be presented as relatable. But while kids were enjoying the colourful, silly orphan babies, the 90s would swiftly bring us back to pantwetting terror with undoubtedly the best dinosaur movie of all time, Carnosaur. <laughs> That's, that's really fabulous. Nah, of course I'm talking about Jurassic Park. Everyone's seen it, and I'm pretty sure it's the reason a lot of you fell in love with prehistory. There's not much I can really add that hasn't already been said about this film, but... Ugh. It just hits so many highs, from the sense of grandeur felt when we first see the Brachiosaurus, to the claustrophobic tension of raptors chasing us through the kitchen. But if we strip away the glitz and the glamour of the special effects, and the heart of the human story, what we're left with is a wry criticism of modern science. And look, when I say criticism, I don't mean the keep the Vav G out of my veins nonsense, but a poignant warning to slow down and take stock. You have to remember, this was the decade 
decade that we first successfully cloned an animal and performed the first gene sequencing. Even now, these feats feel otherworldly, and although they wouldn't have the earth-shattering effects that many might have predicted, at least not yet, it's easy to see why many at the time wondered if science was moving just a bit too fast. As Dr. Ian Malcolm so eloquently put it, Yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Much like Godzilla, the sequels that followed Jurassic Park would sacrifice deeper meaning for popcorn action. But that original film will always be a stark reminder of a time when a new Pandora's box of scientific endeavor was beginning to creak open. And this leads us on to where we are now, this weird post-reality where the everyday feels more bizarre than any fiction. Where do dinosaurs fit into all of this? Can they still help us make sense of the madness? Of course they can, what can't they do? We might not have had any new prehistoric properties crop up recently, but the stalwarts have evolved to fit with the times. For example, the recent reboot of Godzilla develops the concept that humanity is no longer the conquerors we once were. Instead of the civilizers of the 40s and 50s, we're now insignificant pawns on the natural stage. And if we're gonna survive, we really need to get our act together and start cooperating with monster and planet alike. For my philosophy nerds out there, it's like the Gaia hypothesis, but with more teeth. Even the Jurassic World series, despite its flaws, should be commended for the way it advocates for a greater awareness of environmental stewardship. In Fallen Kingdom, Bryce Dallas Howard's Claire Deering is shown to have founded the Dinosaur Protection Group, an organization fighting for the rights of the former attractions of Isla Nublar. And just to hammer the point home, when the dinosaurs are auctioned off as commodities later in the film, the consequences are, shall we say, swift and severe. So, where will dinosaur movies take us next? Well, in the short term, we've got Jurassic World Dominion coming out, but more long term, it's much harder to predict. If we've learned anything over the course of this video, it's that dinosaurs have always been a great reflection of the times. Whether they're pushing the boundaries of what's achievable on screen, contemporary ethics, or how we view our world and the things around us, they're more than just mindless monster flicks. And however the future unfolds, with a little bit of help from our prehistoric friends, I'm certain that life will find a way I couldn't resist. But what's your favourite dinosaur film? Let us know in the comments below, and if you're into gaming, we have a list of the best dinosaur video games on our sister channel. There'll be a link to that somewhere on the screen, but for now, my name is Tom, this has been UDS Films, and we'll see you next time.